Ethan Ostroff, welcome to Legally Contented. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Thanks so much for having me, Wayne. I appreciate it. Um, my name's Ethan. I'm an attorney and also an entrepreneur. Uh, I tend to do more than I can handle because I like to, you know, uh, diversify my days. Uh, I own my own law firm and a virtual assistant staffing company for law firms. My law firm name is Ethan Ostroff Law, and my virtual assistant staffing company is Attorney Assistant. Ethan, you're the typical type A attorney. You've just decided to focus all that energy on the business of law as opposed to exclusively on the practice of law. I want to get into that stuff with you because it's my understanding that you were the third attorney on TikTok and yeah, that you right. had something like 200,000 followers even before number four came up behind you. So I want to dive into short form video, especially TikTok, because that is all the rage today, it seems. And until the federal government shuts it down or forces a merger or forces some kind of sale, it might still be the way to go for many attorneys. But I want to start with your legal background because your father is a prominent attorney here in the Philadelphia area. And I want to talk a little bit about his role or at least your experience with his firm and that experience, that role in shaping how you view legal marketing and the practice of law, because obviously he was your age in an era where legal marketing was not a big thing. So talk a little bit about how that experience, both as a father off duty at home, but also working with him when he first came out of law school, how that shaped your view of legal marketing and legal content marketing. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to be here, Wayne. Thanks so much. It's been great to get to know you over these last you know, few weeks and months. Um, you run a great company and I you know, admire what you're trying to do. So thanks for having me here. Um, in terms of you know, my dad's impact, you know, obviously when you grow up in a, a family of lawyers and my dad was you know, sort of second generation, his uncle, my uncle, High Hi Mayerson, um, he worked for his uncle. I worked for my dad, basically you know, middle school, high school, whether I was doing scanning jobs or, you know, moving them to the cloud or, uh, you know, day to day, I always was sort of surrounded with the law. And my dad was in a unique crowd where he, you know, was a very good advocate and really cared, obviously, about his clients and his case handling ability. But his niche really was bringing in business. And he kind of taught me at a young age that you generate your own oxygen, your own cash flow when you're the generator of cases. So going back in time, you know, he was the first on the yellow pages in Western Pennsylvania. Um, he had the first website in the Delaware Valley in 1995, 1996. So, you know, he was always, you know, showing me what being ahead of the curve can do and can impact if you are first in line and willing to accept that you're gonna be judged by some of your peers, accept that, you know, lawyers in the space are going to poo-poo what you're doing um, because that's really what makes you stand out. And, you know, you kind of touched on being the third lawyer in the country on TikTok. Um, I posted my first TikTok in uh, the end of September or maybe the first week in October 2019. And I had just, you know, became a lawyer in April 2019. So I, uh, I was an advertising major at Penn State. So I was always kind of fascinated with the selling yourself as a service. I didn't quite know from marketing to operations to day-to-day -day case handling where I quite fit. Um, but uh, when I was working in my dad's firm, I had the opportunity to convince them they need a, and them by, the, I mean, the managing partners at the time and my dad that they needed a, a, a tech forward thinking COO they hired somebody and they quit three or four months later. So there was this huge vacancy in operations and I moved into that role. And that's kind of how I got to where I am now. It's incredible to have not only a father who was in the law to give you the lay of the land, but also one who was as progressive as he was in terms of legal marketing and advertising. And I think generally speaking, personal injury and direct to consumer attorneys are going to be more advanced on marketing and advertising than their B2B counterparts. But still, to your point, even today, there are attorneys who are on TikTok, on social media, who get dirty looks from other attorneys at bar events or in court because it's like somehow they are degrading the profession by educating the audience, educating people who aren't attorneys about their legal issues. So it's great that you had that experience. And Obviously, it was baked into 
your view of the world, of the legal world especially, that it's okay to take chances. It's okay to stick your neck out and test. Let's throw some money here behind this effort or let's see if TikTok gets some pickup because the worst thing to happen is to ignore platforms, ignore opportunities that could actually be very fruitful and profitable, but that fear of being judged by the bar just hangs over your head. It's not just the bar. It's our friends. It's our family. It's our loved ones. It's our, you know, our spouses we're scared to be judged by. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily have that experience. I, I picked my spouse and my, 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 my friends because we are non-judgmental with each other. That being said, you know, something that I kind of live by is two pieces when it comes to content creation. One, just accept that you're going to be judged. You know, whether you sit on the sidelines, whether you are hitting the game winning shot, you're going to be judged. So getting over the fact that it's going to happen mentally prepares you to have low expectations about, you know, really caring what other people think, because it's going to happen. I have no control over that. I know I get judged. I know I get called a fake lawyer, but I also know that I've made a cataclysmic impact with thousands, if not millions of people at 30 years old, because I have a hundred million impressions on social media. I have generated over 10,000, it's actually 12,000 leads in my first, you know, 15 months of owning my own firm. So, you know, while other people are scared to act because they're scared of judgment, it creates an opportunity for those who are willing to accept they're going to be judged anyway. Um, a kind of way I think about it, uh, I'm sure those who are listening or watching this have heard of somebody named Gary Vaynerchuk. If you haven't seen him, he's Gary V on every social media. He was who said, hey, there's this opportunity on TikTok. Go give it a try. I gave it a try. And on my first video, I had a 250,000 view video. That opportunity doesn't exist anymore. There are now thousands of lawyers on TikTok. But because I was willing to give it a try, when the consumption was way higher than creation, I had my opportunity. Uh, and the way I kind of frame it mentally is uh, I think about myself sort of like I'm, you know, LeBron James. I'm on the court. I'm going to hit the game winning shot because that's my job. But when I miss the game winning shot, the crowd's going to boo me. You know, everything to me now is kind of just crowd noise. I get to select who's on my bench, who I take advice from, who I let mentor me, who I actually will value and listen to their opinion. But if you're in my crowd, you could cheer for me. You could boo for me. I don't really hear any of it. So you know, mentally, I think, feel like that's a really good way that kind of could get people over that fear. And I'll add to the sports analogies here. You often hear pitchers in baseball, kickers in football. If they throw a bad pitch, they give up a home run or they miss a field goal. They have to have a short memory. You can't let what just happened impact your future. Otherwise, it's going to go downhill quickly. So if you have something that bombs, or even if you have something that's great and goes viral, there's no guarantee the next thing is going to repeat that same result. So you have to be level-headed about it and not be afraid to keep on moving, even when sometimes it feels like you're either a bulletproof because everything's hitting or nothing you can do is going to go right because you've had some failures in the past. Yeah. And please excuse my dog. I do work from home. I just started my practice. I, I don't even really have a, a true physical space other than for Google. So you know, I'm sorry about that background noise. It's all good. Is the authenticity just shining through the audio and video here. So, um, you so know, something on that note, if you don't mind, Wayne, just real quick, um, you know, in terms of like fear of direct judgment on your content, like let's say you're scared of a bad comment, for example. If someone, there's two pieces to that, takes the time to consume your content and they put a angry comment on that content, one, that helps your engagement rate. Therefore, they're actually helping you get promoted organically to more people. And two, you know, if you show that person empathy and think, wow, this person must be in a very sad place to, you know, call me an ambulance chaser on my ad. You know, it kind of shifts your framework to feeling bad for that person, not actually hating that person. To your point about the first aspect, the engagement, it takes a lot of time to, to stop what you're doing. And even if you rattle off something quickly and it's not thoughtful, the fact that someone stopped what they were doing and turned to your piece of content to engage with you, that there's something there. 
right? Like it, it shouldn't be ignored. There's a joke about the classic Howard Stern line where people kept tuning into him to see what he would say next. They didn't like him, but they wanted to hear what he was going to say next. So he got radio listeners and grew his ads and grew his overall kind of prominence because people tuned in to see what he was going to say next or hear what he was going to say next. Same thing here where people are tuning in to see you. The fact that they've consumed your content, it counts as engagement, but there might be something there. And then comes the empathy side, which is maybe if you engage with them and you didn't come across as a crazy person, but you actually came across as a nice, thoughtful person, their tone might change. And who knows who that person knows? Who knows what opportunities lie there for you just to make it, make that relationship nice with a positive comment as opposed to a go F yourself type comment. Yeah. And trust me, I've gotten called every name in the book. So, you know, being called, you know, one more bad name at this point doesn't really, you know, matter. And that fear of judgment, you know, of let's say you post something on your, your Facebook as a reel or, you know, your Instagram and your friends and family see it, you know, those are the people that like should be your client. They know you. So if they know that you handle catastrophic injury cases, they should be coming to you. So, you know, if you really believe in the service you're selling, which, you know, at the end of the day, we're just selling services. We all, you know, are just running paper mills. We're taking trees and we're creating paper at the end of the day. It's not that unique. If we don't get ourselves out there and our friends and of friends and family don't even hire us, why would you expect that someone that doesn't even know you would? Let's take on that in a particular way, because it sounded like you had the opportunity if you wanted to at your dad's firm, you could have spent the next decade or two building it out, maybe taking over the mantle from him when he's ready to retire. What made you decide a couple of years back to leave and to go out on your own and forge this unique independent path for yourself? Sure. The age old question. Um, so when I was at my dad's firm, my primary responsibility was um, after I gave up my uh, my files uh, um, and I moved into an operations role, I oversaw their marketing, their intake, and their transition into the 21st century where I moved them from needles case management system to Litify. And uh, once I got them on to Litify successfully and was running successful mass tort campaigns and was generating cases through referral sources. And, you know, once I saw, you know, where I wanted to go, you know, in full transparency, Wayne, uh, I wanted to take my dad's firm to be, you know, bigger and better than Morgan and Morgan. And that wasn't necessarily what everybody wanted there. And uh, I definitely was an equal, you know, pain for the people there as they might have felt to me at the time. Doesn't mean I'm not overwhelmingly grateful for my opportunities there. And I would not be here today without the opportunity at a younger age to be managing the operations of a full, you know, $100 million revenue law firm. Um, but once I got on to, uh, once I got them successfully on to Litify and I delegated, you know, several of their tasks to virtual assistants and built out their operations in a way that allowed them to scale. You know, I was successful in my implementation of their new case management system. I was successful in delegating intake, all their admin work to virtual assistants. I was successful in generating cases. And once I started realizing that, you know, when I was sending those leads to referral partners and they weren't converting as well as I wanted them to. And when I brought on my first virtual assistant client, a really big personal or uh, work comp firm in the Philadelphia area. We started with three VAs, and as of today, they have 65 through my company. Um, I saw the writing on the wall that, you know, my my proof of concept was there, and it was really difficult to, to get buy-in sort of in the traditional law firm setting. And I wanted to do things different, so I made the decision to leave to start my own firm where I generate my own leads, sign cases, and I send signed contracts to my partners on a referral basis. As of today, I don't have the cash flow to actually handle. Long term, I'd like to cherry pick and handle some cases, uh, but today I'm not. Um, and I'm placing virtual assistants at firms sort of to generate enough cash to see, to cover the overhead of my scaling firm. So I might have to give this podcast to the local area law schools <laughs> to educate students because you just gave a miniature master class on the business 
of law and the acquisition of clients and how this works because it's amazing how few attorneys, even 10 years into their careers, don't understand that yeah. there is a system here. There's a process. And even when you hand off a case to a referral, to a, an outbound referral, there's no guarantee the attorney is going to close that sale. And no. that is insanely frustrating when you may have had to lay out the cash to acquire the lead, or you've primed that lead to, to say yes to the attorney. And then you refer them out and the attorney doesn't call them for a day or two or three or 10. How would you handle that when it comes to referral attorneys who, who kind of bungle the handoff, they fumble the handoff? Yep. So uh, I won't say their name. But the first, uh, the first successful mass tort campaign I ran, I ran on Facebook and TikTok ads. Now, TikTok ads manager, and we're not going to get too deep into how to actually place ads. It's just not the subject for today. But TikTok does not allow legal advertising the same way they used to. I was the only lawyer in the country running personal injury ads for about two months. I was generating like four to five dollar leads on TikTok, wow. and then they kicked me off, which sucked, but um, I'm still having success on Facebook and Instagram. Um, what I learned right when I started my practice and when I was at my dad's firm is that if you are not in control of conversion, nobody makes money. And increasing your conversion percentage from a pre-contract standpoint is the only KPI that matters. And by KPI, I mean key performance indicator that you incentivize and bonus your team off of. So I built a KPI structure that incentivizes and pays a individual bonus and a team bonus on the most important thing, which is getting the paperwork signed. And in uh, January, in my 13th month of practicing, we signed 300 cases. Um, that's a combination of lead gen plus conversion but there's a lot of uh, referral partners out there who will generate these leads, whether organically, through ads, and then they'll just kind of pass them off to the law firm to convert. And what I've learned really quickly is that generally speaking, unless you can convince me, I assume your conversion sucks, honestly. <laughs> unless you show me under your hood, and can prove to me that you call your leads 15 times like I do until you give up, that you have a cadence of follow-up, that you touch your leads at least every three days. Here's an interesting one. How frequent do you hear that a law firm has a full-time outbound dialing intaker for nights and weekends? It's shocking. I have seen five to 10 out of my hundreds of law firms I've talked to that have like anybody that is doing outbound follow-up for nights and weekends. And we think about it, it's like everyone's at work during the day. They're not sitting by their phone waiting to be intaked for their personal injury case. They're busy. And yet no one staffs for this. So my, my team is 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week, outbound and inbound dialing on my leads 15 times until they convert. And I send signed contracts. And in some case types, like let's say medical malpractice where liability is really sophisticated, I'll send highly vetted leads to my referral sources. And I find that there is very little to no fumbling on conversion on cases I want because I really own the conversion process. It's such a profound point that as they say, there's holes in the bucket and if you cannot plug those holes and you might be killing it on lead gen, but you can't get to the finish line, then you, the ROI is going to be terrible. Your profitability might drop because you're, you're spending money and you're not actually reaping the rewards from that. Yeah. What are some of the strategies that you see law firms employing that helps them rebound on their conversion rates? Is it as simple as sure. the outbound, an outbound call team? Yeah, I'm just gonna write. I'm just gonna write something up. So, um, there are four kinds of intakes. Got a little notepad here. All right, are, are you able to see this? Yeah, sure. Good. Four categories, okay? Live leads, form fills, schedule callback, follow up. Live leads, form fills, schedule callback, follow up. 
in that order, live leads, form fills, schedule callback, follow-up is conversion percentage. As you go down this, your conversion percentage will generally go down. So what I do for my firm, for the follow-up role, that is my entry-level position for people that come to my firm. All they do is touch leads that have already been touched. Therefore, they're going to get less on the phone. But someone who's maybe newer on my team, I'm a little less stressed because the conversion percentage is lower. And that person that I want, the next catastrophic injury case, they're going to be calling in these other three categories, live leads, form fills, schedule callback. That's my closers club. My closers <laughs> club are the only people permitted to touch those. Those are people that have been with me long enough, that have closed enough cases, that have converted at a high enough percentage that I trust that they should be touching my hottest leads. So the firms that do the best, they segment a follow-up outbound role and they have nights and weekends outbound dialing for follow-up. This is where the money is made, is in follow-up. Yes, your conversion is lower. And if your KPI of you get a certain amount of money for assigned case is equal across these, follow-up gets neglected. Why? Because it's a lot more difficult to get a client on the phone, the 10th call, than the second call or the first call. So the firms that do the best, number one, they use a intake tracking software. They have Lead Docket. They have Litify. They have Clio Grow. They have some sort of intake tracking software. And they have an emphasis and they have a specific person who is dedicated only to doing outbound dial-up Dial, dialing for follow-up. Does that make sense? Totally. It sounds so, like you really have to map this out, right? You were mapping out that journey and the duration of when you would expect a lead to stay fresh versus stale, and then construct your follow-up process, your intake process accordingly to, to match that journey of the lead. Yep. And because my firm today only is based on generation and intake, you know, my, my trial work, my sophisticated deposition is intake. This is my entire focus is refining this process. And for my own firm, uh, having a KPI structure that incentivizes signed cases plus a team bonus for every signed case so people don't like step on each other uh, has been a huge impact from, you know, uh, in... September, we had about a hundred ish signed cases. As of today, we're approaching a thousand. We're at 970. And these are signed and accepted cases from my partners. Yeah, it's incredible. We started on the back end in terms of the conversions. Let's talk about the more public facing of the wider net, which is the content you've been creating on TikTok for a couple of years now. And I was hoping you could start with your mindset. So, so you're, you're watching some Gary V content somewhere on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, Instagram, and you start thinking about TikTok. How did you approach your content creation on there at first? Did sure. you linger a bit and check it out? Did you say, you know what? I have a feeling I should go toward this. How did you actually dive in and how that shaped so, your content in the early days? Yeah, sure. So it started very much on a frequently asked questions basis. So I would come up with topics based on questions I was hearing multiple times on intakes and things like that with clients. So, you know, if I got asked, what does UIM mean? Underinsured motorist coverage. What is limited tort, which is very niche Pennsylvania uh, tort reform law? Um, you know, what do I do if I get in a car crash? What do I do after I slip and fall? And these very sort of high level how to's kind of, I was, there was a few lawyers on there before me. One was the lawyer. The other was the GA lawyer and their content. The lawyer is like G rated, silly content, like totally joking in all of his content. The GA lawyer was more like personal. It was like kind of like her vlog basically. Whereas mine was, if this situation, do these three things, do these five things. And the most important plug that built trust is I never actually say to hire me that I would define as billboard. So it's just value driven. What does the viewer sitting on the couch who's watching and scrolling through TikTok, what are they taking and learning from what they just watched from me? Did I just help them the next time they're in a car crash? Did I just help them to know what to do to not 
you know, preserve the evidence the wrong way in a premises liability case. Um, and I would pick these areas that like, I mean, really at the time, there was like five of us in the country in total putting out any content at all like this. And now, you know, it's a flood. So uh, I, I don't want to sound obnoxious with this, but ways that I strategically did it, like when I was doing it, I wasn't copying anybody. There was no one to copy at the time. So my strategies were truly original. I never like did it off of what someone else was doing. It was just like, how can I give the viewer something that they can then put in their pocket and save for later? One of the great things about TikTok is the algorithm and the ability for it to really home in on what people are liking and then serve them up videos that are very similar in that vein. Did that require you to have to pay close attention to TikTok trends and yeah. whether the sounds, whether the styles, if you scroll down to many lawyers, bottom of their TikTok feeds, almost all of them start with those pointing videos where they just have music. They're not saying anything, but they're pointing at the words on the screen because that was the way to do videos at a certain point. I TikTok. did the first one of those, like yeah. literally the first one on TikTok as a legal you know, concept was mine. Um, so how much I know exactly is, what you're talking about. How much is the burden on a TikTok creator to stay up to date on trends to be able to continue doing well with the algorithm? Sure. So trends are just one lane. You know, there is frequently asked questions. There is how to's. There is trends. It's sort of a blend of all of these things that mix together that create a good social strategy. Now, you know, you don't want to just do trends. You don't want to just do lawyer reacts. You don't want to just do frequently asked questions because, you know, I, I actually think the next wave of the most relatable content is not even talking about the law at all. It's talking about, you know, things that you're interested in that someone might resonate with. You know, I, I'm contemplating just talking about like the Philadelphia Eagles, but, you know, since the Super Bowl loss has been too emotional for me. Um, but you know, having a channel that like, you know, lawyer who talks about sports, that's more relatable now than just, you know, lawyer who talks about law, law's boring. You have to weave it in and out, but someone who does an, a, a fantastic job of weaving in and out of the law trends topics, if you go look on, uh, YouTube attorney, Tom, Tom is a, a buddy of mine. He really broke ground on TikTok, and um his breaking ground was hilarious. He basically wrote a fake motion to the TikTok bar and tagged like the six of us at the time that were on it. And like it trended, I like re, you know, I, 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 I don't know, I re whatever it's called on TikTok, I forget, um, where you like kind of post, I do edit it where I could like have it next to me. And all of a sudden now Tom is way more popular and way more hilarious than me. Um, someone else that is actually building a course that I actually just signed up for. Uh, Law by Mike is the most viewed lawyer online. He took what I did on steroids. He's really fantastic at content creation. And he actually just came out with a course that he's starting to sell, basically helping people come up with topics, how to video better, how to set up your, you know, your entire process essentially. So, you know, there are now more resources than there used to be, but, you know, at the end of the day, just doing is the most important starting point. Just do it. Record vertical video, post it to all the vertical platforms, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, TikTok, Facebook. Create long form content if you'd like. Post it to YouTube and you can repurpose it. So you shouldn't be posting for one platform in my opinion. You should record based on the orientation, vertical and horizontal, and then you can post it to all the platforms. What's your opinion of the day in the life type videos normally with voiceovers? I have noticed that there's a fair amount of female attorneys. Maybe I'm just, I have a bad sample size, but I feel like it's more on the female side than the male side of attorneys living their life. They're do going out to dinner with their spouse. They're going shopping. What's your take on those? And is that closer to the affinity type marketing that you referred to about the sports? Yeah. Topic? Um, I think it's closer to the affinity. Um, listen, tr just try try different types of things, see what resonates. The data will show what works. Um, I personally am of the opinion that people generally don't like 
care about you. They care about themselves. So I try to give in every piece of content as much as I can. So like day in the life is not something I probably would do unless it was more of a community building exercise where you're kind of like using it as a framing of not like, hey, you should hire me, but more in like a, hey, if you want to become a lawyer, this is what your day to day would look like. So, you know, it's kind of just if it's education based, it can work. But if it's selfish based, it's not. Did you have any concern about being so early on on TikTok that you might have been too early or or early on a platform that didn't really survive? You've got the graveyard, including Google Plus of perhaps Clubhouse sometime soon. Was that at all concern of yours? No. Being early and being wrong is not a problem. Being Being too late and being wrong is a problem. So if I was wrong about TikTok, I'd be in the exact same position I am right now. But because I was right, I now have a nationwide brand at 30 years old with 100 million impressions. The upside of being right when you are first in line is exponential. So don't let sort of a hesitation of, well, should I do this? Should I not? Am I scared? That is what slows you down from being, you know. A, a, a leader in the space, a, a game changer in the space, someone that makes the space different. And my vision is to place a million jobs and to represent more people than anyone ever. That only happens if I'm first in line and I take risks. So. One of the things I remind my clients who are often on the B2B side is that being first to do something doesn't mean you're the first ever to do it. It just means that you are taking a different approach and taking a different view based on the audience, based on your practice area. There are, for example, there are plenty of corporate law firms that put out some kind of foundational research product or research project that they can then slice and dice and fuel their content and thought leadership and business development efforts for a year. But if you're the first firm to do it in a particular area, you've got a little bit of leeway because you've seen other firms do this. And there's a joke that lawyers never want to be first. They want to be second. They want to know that someone else has done it. Then they can go forward and do it on their own time. So I think it's important to understand that being early to something doesn't mean that you have to be the third attorney on TikTok. It could be that you are the first family law firm to do this kind of program in this space and, and test it. And there's no reason why you have to spend $30,000 to invest in something where you can throw a couple hundred dollars, throw a couple thousand to, to try it and see what happens. Yeah. And if, to your point, being late and wrong is worse than being early and wrong. Yeah. I mean, let's just back up here. Everybody watching this, if you're not on social media, you're late. I'm just making that clear. You're not early anymore. You're late now. So now you're just keeping up. So, you know, typically in a client research process, a millennial research process specifically, who are, you know, going to be soon the most populated part of our planet. Uh, a millennial won't just go to your, you know, see a billboard and convert. They will not. They will go and check out your website. See how many Google reviews you have. Great. That's layer one. Then they'll pop on an Instagram. See if you exist. If you don't have a presence at all, or if it's too template cookie cutter, they won't hire you anymore. So social media, organic social media is, is required now. It's required like a website was five years ago. If you don't have a website right now, you're kind of like, it's like, what are you doing? But if you have a website and you don't have an Instagram, you don't have a TikTok, you don't have a YouTube. In a year from today, it's going to be like not having a website feels right now. So, you know, you can't. You, the, the old theory of like, if you do good work, clients will come. No, if you are where eyeballs are, clients will come. It's, it, it, I can tell you as a 30 year old who started their own practice, has been a part of a big content generation firm who has generated tons of clients. You know, I would not be generating the amount of cases or have a hundred Google reviews of five stars if I was not in people's face all the time consistently. So it's almost like if you aren't on social right now, 
you're not only just falling behind, you're becoming kind of like a, a scary option for someone to hire because you just need a baseline of social media exposure to just not look like, you know, uh, a hole in the closet law firm. Do you advise law firms and lawyers, would you advise them to spread out and go on Instagram, go on Facebook, go on TikTok, or do you counsel to be more narrow in terms of the social media channels they choose to pursue? So uh, there's really three types of content that I suggest you think about. Content type one is short form. Content type two is long form video between three to seven minutes for horizontal orientation YouTube. But what you got to keep in mind is that YouTube is more of an SEO play than it is a video play. Yes, if you have a video that people engage with and organically, you know, you somehow struck gold on what not to say to an insurance company and it goes viral, which won't happen as your expectation, just so you know, um, that, uh, that is more of an SEO play. Your goal on YouTube, specifically YouTube, is to get monetized. Once you get monetized, then you start showing up in the suggested search. If your descriptions on your videos don't have the right keywords, no one will see your videos because YouTube is the second most searched platform on the planet. So the goal is for people to land on your videos. Whereas with TikTok, there was a website, Wayne, I'm not sure if you remember this. It was StumbleUpon. Do you remember that website? Sure. Of course. So StumbleUpon, you would go on this website, you click a button, and it would literally stumble upon a random website on the internet. That is TikTok. The For You page on TikTok, people are not intending to see your content. They just happen to maybe interact with some similar things. So you, TikTok pushes yours to theirs. There is no intent on that topic. So short form video is the quickest thing to get started. Pure value driving. Do not ask for someone to hire you. That's the easiest place to start. You should repurpose that content on all the platforms, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, Facebook, TikTok, repurpose that same content on those four things. YouTube, unless you have an in-house SEO researcher, you should not stress about doing long form content. That's a much bigger production. As you can tell, I have a room for it. Yeah. Um, in terms of B2B though, I would be focused on LinkedIn. LinkedIn written word content. LinkedIn is not a video platform. If you notice, I did not say to post your stuff on there. Wayne does a good job of it because he has the, the keywords around it for it to rank the right way. But uh, generally speaking, LinkedIn is more written word and engagement through the written word. You know, so in terms of how you do B2B marketing, I would be writing thought provoking pieces of content. And this might be a more comfortable starting place for people who don't want to necessarily be on camera. You might be an excellent writer. That might be a great content strategy for you. You write a thought provoking piece of content with a thought provoking question at the end. And then you use Gary Vee's two cents policy where you go on to other pieces of content and you comment your two cents. So hope that wasn't, that's sort of my crash course, Wayne. Well, and I think it's so important that people understand that their audience might not be homogeneous. They might have people who are in different platforms looking at different things. And on one hand, if you're a small operation, you can't expect to be doing all the work yourself and it might be too much. Maybe you just build a following on Instagram or TikTok and then you move on to other platforms or you find an AI based service that can repurpose content for you easily and cheaply. And then when you scale up, then you start thinking strategically about, gee, maybe Instagram is more of a recruiting tool and that'll be videos behind the scenes. TikTok will be more personal so people can get to know me. LinkedIn will be more serious. And now people can get this 360 view of you based on a composite view created by all the individual social media channels. I think that is a way to approach it when you have to kind of go step by step. You can't just launch with a full content creation staff that you're paying 300 grand a year total to because you're creating content, video, audio, and written word so often. Yeah. yeah. And on that subject, Wayne, without my team, I would not be able to put out as much content as I do. I put out like 20 pieces of content a week. So I have a full-time video editor. 
I have a social media manager who makes sure that DMs and comments are properly responded to from my frequently asked questions bank I've been building for three years. Um, I don't miss things on my social. I'm, I'm vigilant about it. Um, but uh, if it wasn't so simple that I literally just sit in front of this room, pop in the mic, uh, in, in the chip, put it in my computer and throw it in a drive and say, you know, I'm done with my part. I wouldn't be able to scale it the way that I have. Um, my entire team are VAs. The VA editing strategy is a much longer ramp up period. It will be way more dependent on you as the owner of that process. The much faster route is hiring somebody stateside. But like Wayne said, these are not cheap people. They have expensive equipment. They have degrees in this stuff. They're really excellent at editing. So, you know, the longer terms, more scalable approach might be a VA approach for your editing, um, but it's not an overnight process. It took me months and months and months to be able to have my team do what they do now. For those people out there who are listening or who are watching and are not thrilled with the idea of them being on camera, whether it's just they don't think they do well on camera, whether they think they're more of a written word person, do you, Ethan, think that people can learn camera presence and can learn to be an effective presenter for the purposes of social media over time if they spend time and energy intentionally trying to get better? Yeah, I, I forget what the book was called, but my first content creation strategy was actually through a video email program called Bomb Bomb, B-O-M-B. -B, sure. B-O-M-B. -B. And I would send video emails and the basic strategy within Bomb Bomb helped me with TikTok, which is your first cut is the most authentic. So for me, I rarely do a second cut. I really try the first cut to have that be my final cut. So, you know, for me, my most genuine strategy is to fumble on my words sometimes. It's to be myself and I don't stress about it. So uh, in terms of a starting point for there for people, uh, look on Amazon. I forget what it's called off the top of my head. Maybe Wayne, you can find it for the for the listeners and for the crowd. Maybe put it in the bio. There's a book that Bomb Bomb sold that just basically teaches the basics of setting up your camera, front lighting, how to approach the content, and like it's like a hundred page book. And that book actually helped me learn the very very basic starting points of content creation. Do you think people care about a video being too informal? Do, they, do you think people are going to look at an attorney and see them walking around outside or see them with their dog jumping up behind them or their kid running in and think negatively about that? Because I think there's a lot of lawyers, especially lawyers, who are concerned that informality somehow suggests weakness or lack of intelligence or lack of seriousness. I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. So yes, the answer is yes. And you have to accept that some people won't like your content. It's okay. You know, if you are pissing off someone, that means you are doing something right. Uh, in my opinion, I made it when I got my first cease and desist, you know? <laughs> so, you know, in terms of uh, doing it the right way, there is no right way. Being your authentic self means sometimes telling a story that's a little more personal than you want to get. The more genuine you are with your crowd, then the more genuine your clients will be with you as their attorney. So you can expect that people will judge you. You can expect that people won't like your content. Who gives a shit? Just run with it. Let them not like you. Let them talk about it to their friends. There are some people who will tell you that viewership numbers and engagement numbers on social media are pure vanity Numbers, they don't mean anything unless you're getting leads or clients and bringing in like twenty dollars into your firm or your business. In your view, is that true? And does that mean that it's only a lead gen tool and it can't be a branding tool? No. Uh, so in my practice, there's the organic land and there's the ads land. Ads land, my focus is to drive clients with a call to action to hire me. In organic land, though, it's to educate the crowd so that when they're doing research about me, they know I'm a legit person and that I know what I'm talking about. So this is sort of authority building more than it is even brand building. You know, instances of me speaking on stage, talking about nuanced, complicated areas of the law, 
you know, this is my brain surgery over here is the organic land. So, you know, in terms of generating cases, you're not going to generate a crazy amount of organic cases for years, years and years. It just won't happen. And your expectations need to be that on your first TikTok, you're not going to go viral like I did because that opportunity isn't there anymore. It should be, you know, not so focused on lead gen on the organic. But yes, go run an ad on Facebook that asks for your client to hire you in certain kinds of cases, but do it in a way that, you know, the way that I target ads, and I know we're not going to get too into this, but I'll just kind of touch on it philosophically because it's tied to this. The people on Facebook that will hire you are the ones that don't know they need you, don't know they have a problem. So for example, in my practice, I represent people for mass torts. So for example, I ran a campaign on the Philips CPAP recall. People don't realize that their lung cancer was from the Philips CPAP they've been using for 15 years. So by saying, if you were a loved one, use the Philips CPAP, please watch this short video. Did you know it was recalled and your lung cancer could be connected to that? Click below. Now you're an authority. They trust you because you just told them, I mean, who doesn't want to know where their cancer is from, for God's sake? You just gave them maybe the most valuable information they've ever received in a punchy video and you're giving them clear direction. Go hire me. That's ad land. But in organic land, the way that you generate cases, generally speaking, is from comments. It's from DMs and it's from mining those processes so that you're aware and ready when people do come to you, but you shouldn't expect it to flood in over there. I like the idea of the organic social media as priming the pump as right, giving people a chance to see a, a longer kind of volume of a longer duration of videos of you, a longer kind of library of videos of you get to know you through these videos. And then to your point, when they might need you, then that's when they might call or they might forget about you and then see you on Facebook or Instagram ad and call you. But the idea to warm people up so you are not just another lawyer, but they feel like they know you, they've heard your voice, they see your face, maybe they've seen you out and about with family or your dog or whatever, but people need to be, to feel a connection these days because it's so easy to through social media after you follow someone for so long. So I like that idea of the yin and yang of the paid with the organic. And I think that might make people feel better that they don't have to have the pressure of TikTok being the only way to bring in cases. It's complimentary. It's not the way to do it. It's, right. it's sort of is like if someone is doing an extra layer of research and they just make sure they might, you might not ever get clear attribution. They might bounce from your website to TikTok to Instagram back to your website, then convert. Is that a website conversion attribution? Is that a TikTok conversion attribution? No, they all are omni-channel to help make sure that you are credible for when they're ready. Do you have any pushback from clients who see you, they see your face, they hear your face, they follow you, and then they come to your firm only to learn that you, Ethan, are not going to be the attorney who's going to help them throughout their legal process? Great question. Um, I do not deal with a problem with that because I am extremely transparent about my business model. So what people don't know is the right lawyer for their situation. I solve that for them. I'm humble enough to say, if I were handling your medical malpractice case, it might be malpractice for me to do so because I don't have the level of experience that some of the best in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh have. They have armies for this process. They are the right firm for you. And that's why. So by taking your time and setting the expectations that, hey, you wouldn't want Ethan to be handling this case. I'm here to connect you with the right firm basically for free because I share on their fee. So it's a 100% value add. I basically frame it that I open my Rolodex to my clients so that they don't have to go and pick and choose for themselves. And the fact that I plug them to the right place, I have seen very high conversion rate, no friction on that process. And people really get the concept and they appreciate it. So it's not a conversation of, you know, you, I don't really do much convincing. The value is very inherent and I don't see a problem with that process uh, because I set the expectations the right way. And on my site, if you go look at it, 
I'm very clear about my language. It does not say you're hiring Ethan. It says Ethan will connect you with his connections. Ethan will, you know, plug you to the right firm. His firm and referral partners are the right firms for you. So I kind of skip the research stage for them. I like that idea. You being the guide, almost like the concierge, helping them through this process early on, guiding them to the right firm. What would you say to the attorney at the three-person immigration firm or the two-person family law firm who is the face of their firm, they're going to bring in the case and their firm would handle it. How would you advise them to deal with that kind of issue where they see Ethan, the local family attorney, and they want Ethan, but Ethan wants to give it to an associate or a paralegal to handle? So first off, uh, if you go around and brag to your colleagues, every time I get on the phone with a client, they sign, that's a problem. You should have that conversion rate. It's not about you. It's about answering the client's questions. I can tell you as someone who has not done intakes in a very long time and has signed over 600 cases since the beginning of the year, it doesn't have to be you that closes that client at all. It doesn't. So for the firm that, you know, is concerned about that and promises to every client, you will talk to me personally. Guess what? They just care that they're getting answers. It's not about you. It's about them. So if your team is trained appropriately to answer those frequently asked questions and you set up the systems so that it takes you out of the weeds, because really at a certain point, you as the CEO of your firm, you are providing the most value working on your business, not being in the business. So every minute you spend executing on tasks within the pipeline takes away value at an exponential rate for your business's growth. So, you know, longer term for the small firms, my suggestion is to keep your foot on the pedal with your marketing. If you have the ability to generate cases, never stop. Use referrals as your release valve. If you are a family law attorney and for some reason you're generating a bunch of personal injury cases, don't turn that channel off. Just find someone you can co-counsel with on a 50-50, 40%, one-third, 25, doesn't matter. It's still not your opportunity cost. So, you know, using referrals as your release valve, handling and scaling as you can, but no, the more you handle, the more overhead you're going to have to carry, the more case costs you're going to have to carry, unless you have a upfront cash flow model like a criminal or a family law, you know, the personal injury firms, the more you handle can lead to a glut, which is not good for your clients. So, you know, that's kind of a, a, a big picture, you know, framework of that. The release valve that, oh, by the way, could actually be an independent cash flow source for you and could fund your primary practice, your expansion. You want to hire people. You want to test out what a new practice might look like. Having that quote unquote mailbox money come in over time is a huge advantage. And gosh, how many law firms over the course of the recent decades have left that money on the table because someone called about PI and they said, oh, we're a family law firm, click. And they, they lose that chance to get two-way referrals from a PI firm or other law firms. It blows my mind how much money is on yeah. the table there. Generally speaking, you should never turn something down. You should try your best to find a home for it. If you can't, and then keep that email, put them on your newsletter and just reach out to those people. Emails are our gold. We are data mining gold. That's all we're doing. And even if that referral doesn't take your that client's case, you've engaged that other referral source and who knows what they may send to you today, tomorrow, next week, next month. As we start to wrap up, I want to leave you with two questions. What was something that you wish you knew about short form video, about TikTok, about video marketing generally when you started that you know now? So uh, there was a period of time where I stopped on TikTok, even after having a few hundred thousand followers. I know it sounds crazy. When I started on there, I think I got on there for the wrong reasons. I think I got on there for Ethan's ego. Once I cracked 200,000 followers, just something happened to me. You know, I, I realized it was about Ethan growing, not about providing as much value as I was promising to my clients. And it, my content started to feel disingenuous. So being humble, I wish that I knew that number one, my opportunity was so temporary and I should have put the foot on the gas much more than I even did. And number two, 
um, I realized after a few years why I was doing it. And when I realized it wasn't, no one really gave a shit about me. I was just early. You know, I, people followed me like a militia. At the time, anybody could get followers at that time. Uh, it had nothing to do with the quality of my content. And when I learned that, then I started to transition my focus to doing right for the client, giving information they did not have access to and doing the right thing for, you know, the industry generally. So once I kind of got away from this is what's best for Ethan, I want to get my name out there to this is what's best for the industry and for people and for people's education. Then the content started to feel a little more genuine and I started getting better results actually. It's amazing how that works. When you serve the public interest, you serve society, that karma comes back to you in various ways. What do you see? Last question here. What do you see as the future of legal marketing, especially content marketing? Everyone talks about chat GPT now up to jet, now we're up to GPT four, but where do you see over the course of the next few years, legal marketing going? Um, I think we're going to have people catching up with where a lot of people are already like myself for this next, maybe 18 months. Um, there's such an opportunity in Facebook ads right now to generate cases. I don't think that that's a forever thing. I think it's a two to three year window. Um, so the next wave of social media, in my opinion, will be decentralized social media. Uh, I imagine the next big platform will be one that pays users to scroll, pays users for their data. And the advertisers skip paying Facebook to advertise and they go directly to paying the user to advertise. There will be a platform that figures that out. And I think that every single social media three, three, four years down the line, I think they're all in trouble from that one platform that figures out how users monetize their own data by just scrolling. So, you know, there are a lot of concepts out there that involve blockchain. And I do imagine that blockchain will have a huge impact in the social media space. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, where the market's going, I mean, I am a, uh, uh, I, I'm a toxic tort lawyer. It's something that I'm really passionate about. I think that there is a uncomfortable amount of people getting cancer and it's preventable. Um, I view cancer cases as the new car crash case, as sad as that is to say. Mm. And cancer, generally speaking, is genetics plus exposure, but mostly exposure. And whether it's water, air, um, you know, there are several pollutants in our deodorant and our shampoos. And I think product recall cancer cases are going to be overtaking the market in the next three to five years um, because cars are going to get safer and safer. Thank God. Um, as smart cars come out, as self-driving cars come out, there will be less accidents, which is good for humanity, but there will be more cancer because there is a disgusting amount of chemicals in our stuff that we just drink. Um, so, you know, that's where I see the market going. I think that those are the cases to accumulate right now. I have about a thousand of them uh, and I'm not turning off the speed. Well, and there's the data mining where you get to know your, you get to know the people in your database, what problems do they have? What products have they used? And then when news breaks of a new product being linked to cancer, you can email the, that database and say, are you using X, Y, Z recent news reports or recent studies show? And they've been, they've gotten to know you because you've emailed them over the course of a couple of years and they are primed to give you their case because they know you and you're in contact with yeah. them. So that's a fascinating, a fascinating marriage of a very pessimistic view of the future, but also the value yeah. of building a list and getting in front of people and building relationships with, the, with potential clients. Yeah, I think that the best decision that a law firm owner who's watching this could make today is to invest in their operations, invest in their case management systems, invest in a intake system. Both of them, they're two different things. If you're not managing your leads well, ask yourself, could I double my lead volume and keep the same conversion percentage? If the answer is no, that is a gaping hole and is preventing you from growing. Could you double your case count? and be just as efficient? If the answer is no, then you should be, your North star is to build an assembly line approach 
on non-client facing tasks so that your case managers focus mostly on client contact. You know, the getting of deck pages, the getting of police reports, the getting of bill balances, calling adjusters to see if they received your demand. That does not drive an ROI for your firm. Those things delegated appropriately will help you get to where you want to get to, which means you don't have to be stuck on the phone waiting for an adjuster to pick up. Imagine if you had someone at your firm who called the adjuster and put them on hold. I have clients that do that with my VAs right now. It's pretty funny. That's um, but yeah, so the future of the law, if you today are not taking your data seriously, you have a problem. If you're not building your systems so that you have a solution that you could still be on in 10 years, like Salesforce, you know, like I'm on, then you're already behind. So. A great piece of advice and great wise words to end the episode on. Ethan, where can people find you? Where would you prefer them to go to learn more about you, the firm, your social media efforts? Send them, send them yeah, somewhere. Yeah, sure. I would, I would scope out some of my social. My, my handle is Ethan Ostroff Law, and I spell my name with two E's. Of course, there's a story behind that too at some point, maybe for another day. Um, my website is ethanostrofflaw.com. Um, go check it out. Uh, if you think I can improve on anything, I love critical feedback. Please, you know, shoot me an email and I'll, I, I'm happy to provide my email for Wayne so that, you know, if someone wants to reach out to me directly, you know, I book calls all the time with people. If it's something that I can help you with, great. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. All right, Ethan, thank you so very much for all the knowledge and wisdom and the masterclass you've given on so many aspects today of running yep. a business, operating it, marketing it. Thank you. Yeah. The last thing, um, so something that we are doing through my uh, virtual assistant company, we are doing a free audit of your intake. We will secret shop your firm, pretend to be clients and tell you where your holes are. So if you want to sign up for a free audit of your intake process, I promise you don't need to hire VAs. You don't need to do anything. We will audit your intake process and tell you where you're making mistakes. I'll put a link for that in the description on this video. Yeah, please do. And that could be like a literally life-changing experience if a firm does not understand how poorly its intake process is operating and with one free audit can get a blueprint for how to fix that leaky bucket, that literally is life-changing for the owner of the firm and the attorneys there. Yeah, would be happy to do it for anybody on here. Thank you so much, Wayne. I appreciate you having me and you know, hopefully we can get together soon. Yeah, Ethan, thanks so much for your time.